Welcome back everybody, my name is Tucker, and as of my time, it is the morning after one of the craziest NBA drafts that I can remember. It started before the draft even began. There were so many different trades and teams moving up and down. There were like four or five trades before the first pick was even made, so much so that I started my live stream a little bit early, and I appreciate everybody that came out. It was super fun. Thank you guys. Uh, but in this video, I'm going to keep things pretty simple uh, in the wake of what was a pretty complicated draft. And I'm just going to go over three winners and three losers of the 2019 NBA draft. And I'm going to start on a positive note with my first winner. And my first winner is going to be a pretty obvious one, and that is the Atlanta Hawks. They were able to move up to the fourth pick. They traded with the Pelicans, uh, and they were able to move up to get a guy that they were really excited about in DeAndre Hunter out of Virginia. But the important part about that trade, in addition to obviously getting Hunter, was the fact that they kept the 10th pick as well, which was something that they were lobbying for the entire time. They ended up giving up 8, 17, 35, and then there were some other assets exchanged as well. But that allowed them to keep 10 and then go ahead and select Cam Reddish as well, who pretty surprisingly fell into their laps at the 10th spot. And there were reports coming out when they initially moved up to number four that they were trying to decide between Hunter and Reddish with that fourth pick. So the fact that they got both of them with two different picks is a huge deal for them. And those are two high level complementary wings that fit extremely well around their current core of guys like Trey Young and Kevin Herter and John Collins. And one of them in DeAndre Hunter has a higher floor, should be a solid player, but might not ever become an all-star caliber player. While the other one in Cam Reddish uh, could potentially end up being a bust, but also has a very high ceiling and high potential. And both of these guys are good two-way players, good two-way wings. They're bigger guys as well. And that's exactly what you need in the modern NBA. Next up now is my first loser, and that is the Washington Wizards. And coming into the draft, they were in a bit of a tough spot because they were in kind of this middle ground where I felt like there was a bit of a talent drop off right when they were supposed to be selecting after players like Cam Reddish and Kobe White were supposed to come off the board. So I'd kind of penciled them in as a team that might end up, you know, looking to, to trade up into maybe the top five or the top six to get a player potentially like Darius Garland or something like that. But actually they ended up in a really good place because Cam Reddish fell to them at number nine. I have a friend who's a Wizards fan. I was texting him. I was like, hey, you guys might get Reddish. This would be an awesome pick for you guys at nine, a high upside player that could be a huge boost to their future prospects. And then they ended up selecting Rui Hachimura out of Gonzaga instead. Now, nothing against him. He's still a very good player and he's someone that could turn out to be really good for them. It just feels like with the context of this situation, this wasn't the right move for the Wizards. They're in desperate need of some high end young talent, not just a solid player, which is what Hachimura projects as in my opinion. And of course, I don't have any insider info or anything on stuff like this, but it kind of seemed like they could have gotten him later on in the draft if they'd chosen to move down and gotten some value out of the ninth pick and then still gotten a guy that they've clearly wanted in Hachimura. But again, it just would have made a little bit more sense uh, under a different circumstance, but within the context of where the Wizards are at right now, at the ninth pick, getting a more solid player rather than maybe going for a bit of a high risk, high reward, high upside guy in Cam Reddish didn't really make that much sense to me at number nine. Moving on now to my second winner, and this one is pretty simple. I've said multiple times in the past that I don't think Chris Dunn is the point guard of the future for this team if they ever want to be a really good team in the Eastern Conference and they needed help at the point guard spot. And I've also said multiple times that Kobe White was one of my favorite prospects in the draft, specifically a point guard, and the Bulls were able to have him fall right into their lap at number seven. And I say fell right into their lap because it seemed like five and six were going to be some combination of Kobe White or Darius Garland. It ended up not happening that way, but it just seemed like leading up to the draft with all the movement that Garland was going to be a player that was gonna be picked at five or six, and then teams were gonna to look to try and get Kobe White right after that, and there was gonna be a lot of movement and trades and jumping ahead of Chicago. And Chicago was one of the teams discussing potentially moving up even to four to get someone at the point guard position like Garland or White. But in the end, they got a great player and they didn't have to give up assets to move up and get them. And in terms of on the court, White should fit in right away as a playmaker and a scorer to give this backcourt a little bit more punch in Chicago. And even though defensively long-term, there are some limitations with him and Zach Levine on the floor at the same time, but the fact that they do still have Chris Dunn gives them some mix and match options there as well to kind of make some things work and counter some of the defensive liabilities that those two players have. And now we get to my second loser and one of the stranger situations 
of this draft because before the draft even started, the Minnesota Timberwolves moved up from 11 to 6 and they used Dario Sarge to be able to do that, which obviously when a team moves up, it means they're targeting a specific player and they're trying to jump ahead of other teams that they think are interested in a player that they really, really want. So when they moved up, I was like, okay, the Timberwolves, maybe they're looking at Darius Garland, maybe they're looking at Kobe White, and that was what Woj reported on air as well. And then right before it really got to their pick, somewhere around like the, when the third and fourth pick were being announced, Woj reported that the Timberwolves were trying to trade back out of six. And that tells me one thing, whoever they traded up for at six is not who they ended up actually selecting and who they actually selected was Jarrett Culver. And so really this isn't anything against Jarrett Culver. He's a good high upside wing, should be good for them and has a ton of potential and could develop into something really special for them. The issue is just that you can tell that this was a bit of a misstep for the Timberwolves because they moved up to six to get somebody and then immediately tried to move back out, presumably because they wanted Darius Garland at six and the Cleveland Cavaliers selected him right ahead of them instead. So that's really the issue here is that they gave up value to move up for a player in Culver that wasn't their first choice at that spot, which is supported by the other reports that said that they were trying to move up to four or five before they ended up settling at six. So that's really the issue here. It's nothing against Jarrett Culver. It's just giving up value for a player that wasn't your first choice at that spot when you decided to move up if you're the Timberwolves. And on top of that, they had to give up a promising young player in Dario Saric to move up. And I really think he was underutilized uh, in Minnesota. And I'll talk about his fit in Phoenix here in a little bit. But basically now the Jimmy Butler trade reads as Jimmy Butler plus the 11th pick for Jarrett Culver and Robert Covington because they ended up trading Saric. Uh, along with the 11th pick to move up to select Culver. So that doesn't read all that great unless Culver becomes a really, really good player. So we'll just have to see moving forward. And my last winner now is a bit of a strange one because it doesn't have anything to do with any of the players they actually selected in the draft, but more so a trade that they made right before it. And that is the Indiana Pacers. And I'm going to talk about the Phoenix Suns here in a second. Trust me, you probably already know that they're the last loser on this list and I have a lot to say about them, but let's focus on the Pacers more so than anything else for this particular section. Right before the draft, the Suns traded TJ Warren plus a 32nd pick to the Indiana Pacers in exchange for cash because they wanted to dump his salary to create cap space, but the Pacers are getting a 25 year old wing with pretty good upside, not a great defender, but just shot over 40% from three on over four attempts per game last season for basically nothing plus a pick, which is obviously awesome value for them, especially considering that they had the cap space to absorb Warren's contract and still have max space left over. And really, I was shocked that they were able to get a player like TJ Warren basically for free. And I'm sure if you offered this deal, if the Suns offered this deal to a handful of other teams around the league, every single one of them would have taken it. And they probably would have questioned why they were just getting a player like Warren for free. I understand that there are some issues with him in terms of uh, some injury issues last year, only played about half the season, but the Suns were tanking, so you never really know if he was legit hurt for most of those games or if they just didn't want to play him because they didn't want to win any games. And I understand that he's not a great defensive player, and last year was the first year that he really had good shooting numbers, but if he can sustain those numbers, he's going to be awesome for Indiana in their wing rotation. And I'm kind of in a wait-and-see mode on the other trades and picks that they made in this draft, but they have to be considered a winner when you talk about the trade that they made right before the draft even started with the Phoenix Suns to pick up TJ Warren. And last up now, and my third loser is the Phoenix Suns. And like I said, I have a lot to say about these guys and it's a really weird situation because I actually really liked two of their moves. I liked the fact that they picked up Ty Jerome late in the first round, they traded up to get him. And honestly, I liked the fact that they traded back from six to 11 and picked up Dario Sarge in the process but there are two other moves that I'm not a big fan of, one more so than the other, that really bring them down and put them in the loser category for me. But let's talk first about the positives. Ty Jerome is an outstanding shooter with pretty good size as a combo guard and an awesome passer and should be able to soak up a ton of minutes at either guard spot for them over the next couple of years. So I really like that pick. And then getting Saric while moving back from six to 11 is an interesting move for them as well. And one that I really like because they've needed a four man for forever. And I think Saric was a bit underutilized in both Philadelphia and Minnesota and could have a much bigger role in Phoenix. And watching him play alongside DeAndre Ayton should be really fun. But the problems here are the previously mentioned Pacers trade that I'm gonna talk about in a second. And then picking Cam Johnson at number 11. And I don't really have a big issue with Cam Johnson, I actually like him as a prospect. I just don't like him being selected as high as 11. He's a pretty big wing that's a really good shooter but doesn't provide much else. And I just feel like they could have gotten value out of the 11th pick 
by moving back and selected Johnson maybe 15 or later. But that's not really the biggest issue here because let's talk about the fact that the Phoenix Suns just gave away a 25 year old wing that just shot over 40% from three on over four attempts per game, albeit only played about half the season, but he's on a fair contract. They gave away him and the 32nd pick in the draft or nothing. This is one of the few first round picks over the last seven or so years that the Suns have actually drafted correctly and gotten a good player out of. And then they made the right move again by signing him to a relatively fair deal in 2017. And then they just gave him away. And I understand, like I've said multiple times, there are some issues. There, the shooting numbers might not be sustainable. We only had one good season in terms of shooting. All the other ones were not good at all. He only played half the season. He's not a great defensive wing, all that stuff. TJ Warren has value. He's not a salary dump guy. He's not a guy that you have to attach a pick to to dump his salary. So this move just doesn't make any sense to me at all. Now, the rationale here was that they were trying to create some cap space to be able to sign someone that's going to be able to help them in free agency. But the problem with that is when you account for the salaries of their draft picks and then Kelly Oubre's cap hold as well, they're only going to be at about $14 million in space, which would obviously be much smaller if they didn't trade away Warren. But I'm not sure who they're getting for 14 million in space. It's gonna make some huge difference for this Suns team considering how bad they were last year and how bad they've been for the last four years. Now they could increase that number up to 22 million if they release Kelly Oubre's cap hold, but he seems like a guy that they would want to try and bring back. And even then, I'm not really sure that they're gonna get the guy that it seems like they really want for $22 million. Because when they first made this move and they dumped TJ Warren, my first thought was, okay, maybe they're making a move to try and create space for someone like D'Angelo Russell to pair him with Devin Booker. But I don't really think you're getting D'Lo for 22 million a year. Just the, the climate of this free agency of this offseason with so many teams having cap space, it doesn't really seem like that's gonna be enough. So I don't know who they're gonna try and get with 22 million in space, but, and that again, that's assuming that they just completely get rid of Kelly Oubre's cap hold and don't have the ability to re-sign him by going over the cap. But you never know, maybe my opinion on this will change in free agency and they'll manage to pick up somebody with that cap space that wouldn't have been possible if they didn't dump TJ Warren. So maybe we're in wait and see mode on this stuff and we'll see kind of how it works out for them and who they're able to sign, but I am not optimistic about this one at all. And in my opinion, it was just an awful move to dump a useful player plus a pick for nothing. And there you have it. That is going to be the end of today's video. And I thank you all very much for watching. Once again, my name is Tucker. If you missed any of my previous videos, then be sure to check out the boxes on screen. Thanks again, and I'll see you all next time.